with our featured speaker. Um, as I've been trying to bring play into classes, I've found that there's different types of play. There's different ways to do it. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen to show you how David and I have kind of conceptualized um, that. So I we kind of think of it as this pyramid or the bottom is like playfulness. It's embodying playfulness as a faculty member doing that with humor, you know, just not being as stuffy professional. Um, the second level is like connection former activities. You might know them as icebreaker activities. Those are simple things you can do. The third level is play to teach a specific thing within the content. And then the fourth level, which I haven't figured out how to do yet, um, is this whole course design, an entire semester built on this idea of play. Um, to my knowledge, I've only found one example of this, and this is Roberto, uh, his example. So if there are other examples, I would love to hear it. Um, but this is a great, great example here. Um, so I'll just turn it over to you, Roberto. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Roberto Carrada. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Lisa and Dave for inviting me to this. Um, I feel like I found my people. I've been uh, in and out of the playposium all day. I have some other work obligations, so um, but I'm going to watch a recording for sure and uh, and participate more in the future. Um, I feel like um, Richard Dreyfus in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You know, um, I'm doing this thing, and other people don't understand it around me. Um, but I kept keep getting attracted to sort of the devil's tower. And I guess that's this playposium. And then when I get here, there's a lot of people like me and they're interested in this and they've gone past dead canaries to get there. Um, so I really, really feel very welcome here and, and uh, like everybody's on the same page. So, um, so I appreciate uh, the invitation. Um, you know, it's interesting throughout the day, there've been people playing around with terminology and I've struggled with this in law school. You can imagine in law school, they don't wanna hear anything about fun and games uh, in learning law. And so I've had to, you know, what I do is simulations, they're simulations. I pull out um, terminology from education that seems serious, but it really is at, at bottom it's play because I'm all about student engagement. To me, student engagement foments passion and leads to true learning. Uh, and so I'm always struggling to figure out how can I get my students more engaged in the class. Um, I've been teaching simulations since 1994. I started with a different simulation. I teach a labor law class in which I allow my students to, uh, if they can figure out how to do it legally, uh, form a union. Uh, and then the union can negotiate with me about the terms and conditions of the class. And we actually um, negotiate a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and. Uh, I remember around the year 2000, after teaching that class three or four times, I gave a presentation to our faculty. And at the end, I had a faculty member come up to me and say, well, you know, all you've done is make learning more fun, as if that wasn't any kind of an important thing. And I said, yes, I have. Thank you very much. But I, I didn't think he was meaning it as a compliment. Um, so, you know, I've just kept doing this thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and fortunately, they've allowed me to do it. And, and I think my students have benefited as a result. So I'm going to sort of present um, the class. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, really, it's an adventure. You know, these whole course simulations are really about complexity in law. Um, I found when I started as a lawyer that law school had let me down, that I had learned some very basic things about being a lawyer, but I hadn't learned anything about legal strategy or really you know, how to do the kinds of complex thinking that lawyers actually had to do. That's something that law schools have you pick up when you start at a law firm and you're working with lawyers. And I felt really there's a need to start getting into that in law school a little bit. Um, so um, this talk will be in two parts. The first is I'm just gonna talk a little bit about foundations. Uh, I found again in law school to be able to convince colleagues that this is a serious kind of approach is to talk about the theory underlying uh, what it is that I do. And then I'll talk about the nuts and bolts of the simulation. Um, the first is uh, in uh, 1999, in perhaps you've seen this book, How People Learn Brain Mind Experience in School. Um, this is uh, put out by the National Academy of Sciences. It's a collection of you know, studies about cognitive learning, you know, brain science and, and how, how people learn. Um, the book itself is kind of dense. 
And I'm just a law professor. I'm not out of science at all. And so um, I uh, became a member of the American Association for Higher Education, which is now defunct. But they had a magazine called Change Magazine for a while, which I would get like on a monthly basis. And for a long time, professors like Debbie Ball at Michigan State at Michigan and, and folks like that would write articles uh, sort of describing what was in the book, what the book meant. Uh, and, uh, and I was attracted to all of that and I thought it resonated with what I was doing. The first thing is, um, I think law schools and lawyers and, and law professors should teach for long-term retention and transfer. I think um, that should be the goal, but we don't teach that way. We teach uh, students to take in a lot of information, read a ton of information, all for the purpose of taking a final exam at the end of the semester. They take the final exam and then they immediately forget all the information they learned. To me, I didn't see how that was really serving uh, anybody. Um, we want transfer and we want long-term retention. And so I've, over 30 years, I've decontented my courses quite a bit. I'm not a coverage person at all. Uh, and that's set up, you know, a good structure for doing this kind of this kind of work. Um, to the 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 things I learned from from Change Magazine and professors writing about uh, how people learn are the following sorts of things, which are very consistent with what I'm trying to do with my simulations. First, the single most important variable is practice at retrieving. So in stu unless students are retrieving that information constantly, um, they're not really going to learn it. Uh, in law school, you go from one topic to the next without looking back. Um, there's a final exam that tests that material, but the students have to put that together on their own. It just doesn't seem that effective uh, to me. Um, varying the conditions under which learning takes place makes learning harder, but leads to better learning. All of you are doing that sort of thing. When you engage in play, when you do uh, games uh, in the classroom, you're, you're, you're asking students to take what they've learned in text, uh, to take what they've learned in other sort of contexts and other so sort of learning and to sort of handle it in this different kind of context. Uh, the, the next thing is exactly the same. Learning is enhanced when learners take information presented in one format and re-represent it in another. Um, games are good for this, simulations, test exercises, skill exercises, uh, all of this. Continuing, the act of remembering itself influences what learners will and will not remember in the future. When you do games, when you do uh, exercises and things like that, you're asking them to sort of, you know, remember material and look at it again. Uh, less is more, especially when we think about long-term retention and transfer. So I've, uh, I've cut down on coverage. Um, students don't end up reading that much in my classes compared to other law school classes. They read a lot less and the whole idea is we go deeper with the material they do get and then uh, hopefully they retain it for longer periods of time. Uh, I haven't done any studies uh, of this. Many of you have. Um, but I've, I have anecdotal evidence from my students that they, that they retain this information in ways that students don't in traditionally taught law school classes. And then finally, and this really is what Playposium is all about, what learners do determines what and how much is learned, how well it will be remembered, and the conditions under which it will be recalled. Uh, and so uh, the games all involve them doing not just sitting there and listening to a lecture. And by the way, I'll apologize for the lecture format of this. One thing I found is if you have to give out a lot of information very quickly, lecture is actually the best format for that. So um, that's why the keynote presentation, but you'll never see a keynote presentation in any of my classes. Uh, in 2007, the Carnegie Foundation came out with a report on law schools, um, educating lawyers. Uh, and uh, I had been teaching simulations since 1994. This came out in 2007. Uh, and they uh, made a lot of recommendations suggesting that law professors should use simulations more. Uh, and it's funny because at that time, nobody had been really paying attention to what I was doing. And then suddenly everybody was like, wait a minute, isn't that the kind of stuff that Karada guy's doing? <laughs> that makes learning more fun. <laughs> That's what they're suggesting, right? Um, just so you know, the Carnegie report said there are three apprenticeships for professional education in law. One is the intellectual or cognitive apprenticeship. The second is the expert practice apprenticeship. And the third is identity or purpose, you know, the professional identity apprenticeship. All of those things are taught in law school, but they're totally siloed. 
Um, and in fact, the overwhelming bulk of courses are all uh, for the first apprenticeship, intellectual or cognitive, almost all doctrinal law school classes really, really, um, I would say are 90 to 100% just that first apprenticeship. The other stuff they get from clinical courses or an ethics course, for example, uh, and um, the uh, Carnegie Foundation said in their report, you know, we think what would be best is if these three apprenticeships are integrated. Um, so it's that every law school class has hit some of this rather than it all being siloed. And well, when I read this, I said, well, that's <laughs> my simulation, which is you have to take the book learning and then you have to learn how to, you know, handle it as a lawyer. And you also have to learn, you'll usually confront ethical dilemmas in doing this. Um, simulations are ways at getting uh, an integrated, um, you know, experience across these three apprenticeships. Um, these are uh, another couple of things from the Carnegie Report. The mark of professional expertise is the ability to both act and think well in uncertain situations. The task of professional education is to facilitate novices' growth into similar capacities to act with competence moving toward expertise. Anytime you're involved in games, in the classroom, you're putting students into uncertain situations and they're gonna be better off no matter what area they go into um, to have those kinds of experiences. Um, uh, again, here from the Carnegie Report, research suggests that learning happens best when an expert is able to model performance in such a way that the learning, learner can imitate the performance while the expert provides feedback to guide the learner in making the activity his or her own. This requires learning the subject matter of law, but in a way that is already structured for performance. In many professional fields, though less so in law, these insights into learning have given rise to the widespread use of simulation as a form of teaching and learning. Uh, and so, you know, the, the best way to sort of um, guide students and sort of into like a critical thinking uh, sort of apprenticeship is exactly, uh, you know, setting up the kinds of situations that you have often uh, in, in these games uh, and simulations. Um, my own thought about legal education, um, legal education is interesting because if you really look at it, it's, it's a confused mix. Um, if you're a law student, you really aren't sure whether you're a student or a lawyer. Um, in every class, they keep talking to you as if you're a lawyer, you're going to be a lawyer, but at the same time, you're sitting at a desk taking notes. And so you're a student, right? Um, so my own view of this is actually, I think the first year of law school, they should be students. There's a lot for them to learn just sitting at a desk. They learn to read cases. They learn to think about um, cases. They learn to extract rules and synthesize cases and produce outlines. All of that uh, does, works very well in a student kind of context where we have the Socratic method, which is inquiry method um, for learning, but pretty much it's really the students are in the classroom, they're at desks and the professors mostly uh, sort of orchestrating the discussion. By the second year now, these students are going to be lawyers in two years. And my own view is they should be put in a situation as if they were a lawyer now as much as they possibly can. Uh, and in the second year, I think that should be all about simulation, um, that all of these doctrinal classes should be simulations where they are taking on the role of lawyer. Um, you have the three apprenticeships sort of integrated into these, uh, and you can work with complexity. Once it's a, when it's a simulation, you control the environment. Uh, and so you don't actually have real clients that you have to worry about. Um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can put students into much more complex situations. And that's my whole idea. That's my whole aim. So I teach labor law and I teach administrative law in a simulation format. In the third year, I think law, law students should be in clinics. Um, they should be actually representing clients in, in court. Uh, and most law schools have, at, you know, to some degree or another, a clinical experience. But to me, that should be the ramp of law school, students first, then simulations, right? And then working with real clients before they graduate and become lawyers. That's my own conception of all of this. And again, this is all my way of talking about this to convince my colleagues that even though I'm engaged in play here, it's all very serious uh, and conducive to legal education generally. Um, all right, so administrative law, engaging statutory structure and complexity. One thing about administrative law, when I teach administrative law in law school, 
Um, students get a series of cases and the cases are out of different administrative agencies and they learn something called the Administrative Procedure Act that way. But what they're really learning are the trees. They're learning the trees of administrative law. They don't see administrative law as a whole. You know, administrative law is these large regulatory agencies like the Department of Education, like the Federal Trade Commission. Um, they don't get to see the structures of these agencies. They just learn little bits about the powers of these agencies in the context of cases. My whole idea with the simulation is, wouldn't it be great if students could actually um, look at a giant uh, regulatory scheme, the complexity of that and play with it, you know, tear it apart, uh, use it for their own purposes. Uh, and um, that's when I came up with the idea of Jurassic Park. So this was a long time ago. This was, in fact, I came up with this idea before the movie was made. Uh, I read Michael Crichton's book. Uh, and what I started doing was using scenarios from Jurassic Park on my law school exams first before I did the simulation course. Uh, but one thing Crichton says at the beginning was what pulled me in. He said at the beginning, all of this could happen because there aren't any regulations of this. There's no US regulatory framework for dealing with the issues that come up in Jurassic Park. So in Jurassic Park, you know, this company goes out to the, an island outside of Costa Rica and starts making dinosaurs and then it all goes bad and they go bankrupt, right? And so there's nobody even to answer for the, for the, ton, for the millions and billions of dollars of damage that these dinosaurs are doing. And so um, the challenge to my students, which I tell them is, so here's your twofold challenge in this class and they have to read Jurassic Park within the first two weeks of class. I say, you're gonna work in teams and you're going to um, develop a regulatory structure to deal with the release of dinosaur DNA into the biosphere. And you can do that however you wanna do it. Here, you have two challenges. Number one is whatever regulatory scheme you come up with has to deal with the issues and problems that arise in the novel Jurassic Park. And number two, that has to all be done within a constitutional and administrative law framework. In other words, you can't do things that are unconstitutional. You might laugh at that, but one of the things, for example, is you could have a governmental search agency not pay any uh, attention to the Fourth Amendment and go after eggs in people's, you know, laundry and in people's, um, you know, um, you know, bedrooms and, and their drawers, right? Um, the Fourth Amendment doesn't allow you to do that. So you, so, so you have the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution as sort of limitations uh, in this game. So you can't just address all the problems without paying attention to the law and the laws of limitations. So those are the, those are really, they begin the class with that as the challenge. Um, the other thing I do is um, I assign teams. So this, the students work in teams and the teams follow essentially um, the, the chapters in the administrative law casebook. There are different powers of agencies. Uh, and so, uh, for example, they have the, the agencies have the power to get information. They can search businesses, for example. Um, they can uh, issue subpoenas to have businesses bring documents to them. Um, there's rulemaking, which agencies can, can issue rules, which are like laws to regulate in a particular area. Um, so the students um, send me on the, before the first day of class, they have a choice of their top three teams. I give them a description of what the teams are. Uh, and then I try to give them at least one of their three choices. Um, I have students um, in teams of no more than four or five. Um, my, the, I follow Johnson and Johnson who've written a lot about teams and cooperative learning. And, uh, and they say don't have teams of, of more than that many because then you have free riders. Um, so small teams um, gets you out of the sort of free rider problem. I have other ways of handling that too, according to the Johnson and Johnson model, which I'll talk about in a second. But the other thing that students do on the first day of class is they get to decide how they regulate. So I tell them you can do, there are three approaches here. Number one is you can decide that you're going to allow private businesses like Walt Disney um, to have dinosaur parks and, uh, and you can create a, a regulatory framework, um, you know, to control all that and to issue licenses and things like that. Or two, you can say, well, this is really dangerous like space flight. So what we're gonna have is a government dinosaur park like, in, you know, like NASA does with space, with space flight for a long time until now uh, could only be engaged in by the government. Um, so this would be the cloning of dinosaurs is only going to be done by the government and we'll have a governmental dinosaur park somewhere in Montana or something like that. Uh, and you can do that. Uh, or you can prohibit 
um, the release of dinosaur DNA into the into the biosphere. You can say the Jurassic Park was so horrible. We we pretend as if what happened in Jurassic Park actually happened, uh, and that's why we're looking at regulating it. You can say it's so horrible that we're going to prohibit this. Uh, and then you create a government agency like, you know, agency that, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, somebody who regulates prohibited drugs, for example, and things like that, heroin, et cetera. Um, and so you can prohibit this, right? Well, you would think logically everybody would say, well, I read Jurassic Park and I saw the movie and let's not have that happen. So let's prohibit this. Um, no students have ever gone for that. <laughs> <laughs> They've either wanted to, you know, allow like Walt Disney to have a dinosaur park or to license dinosaur parks, or they they wanted to do the government, uh, the government dinosaur park. The last time I taught this, they did a combination government dinosaur park for 10 years, and then a two year moratorium period, and then, uh, and then allow some companies to, to create dinosaur parks. Um, the syllabus here, it's, you can't see it very clearly, uh, is very decontented. So um, I would say it's about a third of the material that I would cover in a traditionally taught administrative law class. And the reason for that is all they need is the basic material because they'll get into the deeper stuff as they work on the simulation. Um, cooperative learning, Roger and David Johnson. So whenever I do a simulation, I start with cooperative learning principles. Um, so uh, a lot of professors go off and do group work and they just put team, you know, students in groups and have groups do a group project and grade the group project. I don't do that. I follow these principles. So Roger and David Johnson, and I have their website, um, their URL there at the bottom, www.co-operation.org. I suspect many of you are familiar with this stuff. Um, they say, you know, you have to have positive interdependence. That's the first thing. So um, that's the group project. And, and, and a group project helps the students all be feel like they're on the same team together and they're working toward the same goal. So that's very important. In my class, 30% of the grade is for whatever the group ends up producing. So the group project is 30% of the grade. Promotive interaction just means that the students have to be able to work with each other. So you set up the simulation in a way so that they have to interact. In the Jurassic Park simulation, these teams have to talk to each other. They're producing a single statute and the different provisions, rulemaking and information gathering, they all have to work with each other. So they have to cooperate. Uh, and then individual accountability. And this is very important and what a lot of people leave out. So 20% of the grade uh, in my class is for your individual effort toward the group project. So you keep track of what you do um, to help the group achieve its end. And then you write a report to me at the end of the semester. And this is law school. So I, I tell students they have to bill hours. So lawyers bill. And this is a class where I get a side benefit of they learn how to bill. Um, you have to give me enough of a description. I'm the client. I have to know what you did and why you did it. And that's why I'm paying for it. Um, so students bill their hours. And when they write their report to me for their individual accountability grade at the end of the semester, they attach their hour sheet that I can look at. Um, and, uh, and any other material they want to attach, uh, the research they did, things they did. Uh, so that, And then they can show me what part of the um, statute they ended up drafting on their own and con contributing to the class. And so that's 20% of the grade. That prevents free riders. If they know they're going to have to be individually accountable uh, for their work on the group project, then, um, then, then they, uh, they pay attention and, and they do what they need to do. And, and then they give me their individual report. The other thing that I get in the individual report is that fourth thing there, which is group processing and reflection. In their individual report, they have to tell me why their group made the choices they made uh, about the statute, why they drafted it in a particular way or why they made particular choices. So that way I get the reflection and the group processing. The interpersonal and small group skills, that's sort of a citizenship. Um, Johnson and Johnson talk about the students giving each other a citizenship grade. Uh, I don't really bother with that. I think that over a whole course simulation, you're getting a lot of interaction between the students and the individual accountability grade sort of handles this sort of small group skill stuff. Um, I give some materials about how to work in a small group and how to work with each other and those sorts of things, but I don't grade it separately. So that I do part ways with Johnson and Johnson that way. I'm trying to keep track of the time here. Okay. Um, 
This, uh, sorry, this slide didn't come across very well. A keynote, uh, I, I updated my keynote software last night and some things didn't um, come across very well, but these are just rubrics. I have, the students are doing various activities throughout the class. So for example, I told you they work in teams. Well, the teams also teach the class. So when we get to the information part of the class, um, that's the four people on the team. They, they're in the front of the classroom and they're teaching the students these cases. And I tell them, you, you've had a year and a half of law school and you've seen different professors do different things. So which one did you like the best? You're now gonna be the professor. I sit in the back of the classroom. And what's funny is it's the exact same dialogue I would have if I were in the front. I would call on a student to recite a case, right? And I would ask them questions about the case. Well, here they're in the front of the class and I'm in the back and other students are asking questions. And if they don't cover material I think is important then I ask questions about that material. So it's just really a flipped um, sort of, I'm a student and they're in the front of the classroom, which plays into, that's a, I try to destroy hier hierarchies in the classroom and this really helps. So if I'm sitting back with the other students that help, I mean, they, they know I'm still the professor and everything, but it helps to sort of, um, you know, underscore this idea that you need to be responsible for this material. Um, so I give various rubrics out. So the, the top rubric, which you're missing is, um, the rubric um, that I apply when a student's been called on in class to recite a case. And that is a rubric I'll apply to students who are asking questions of another student who's leading the class. I have an oral argument rubric. Sometimes um, we ha I have classes where students um, are involved in oral arguments as lawyers would make them. And then this is just a basic rubric. And then finally at the bottom there, I have a student's leading the class rubric. It's a seven point scale. I just give these out to the students in advance so they know the, generally the criteria I'm using um, to grade them. And you know, they'll, they'll get 20% of the grade for the class as a participation grade. And participation is all these various sort of ways that they interact with the class. Um, and so I just make sure I communicate to them what the criteria is um, for the grading for the individual participation score. Um, if you're keeping track, the final 30% of the grade is for an exam. I give an exam in this class either it's a late midterm or it's a final exam. Um, if it were up to me, I wouldn't at all. But again, uh, I have to be sort of accountable to my colleagues. I felt like my colleagues might put up with the simulation stuff if I could tell them I'm doing the same thing you're doing, only I have a simulation on top of it. <laughs> so, so I always give a, an exam, but it's, it's a 30% exam is not, you know, these 90% law school final exams. Uh, and, uh, and, and it does make, it, it, it's an individual accountability thing. The students need to study all the material and understand what went on in the class um, to be able to take the exam uh, at the end. So 30% uh, is for an exam. Um, so when I first started doing the Jurassic Park, the first time I did the Jurassic Park simulation was in 2003 and I used Blackboard. And so this may look familiar to you from 2003, um, I could set up the teams uh, and have them have their own discussion board, uh, their own file exchange and their own email exchange. Of course, now students can do this all on their own. You know, they use Slack, um, they use uh, and Facebook, they set up Facebook pages to communicate with each other as a team. So I am now out of that part of this. Um, they, they figure out on their own how to communicate as a team. All they need to know is who the team members are and they can communicate very well uh, on their own. Uh, now for the teams to communicate with the rest of the class, you know, um, I have a Canvas shell for these classes, as you can see there. Um, I set up um, forums for each of the teams. So the teams, and these are the coordination team, the rulemaking team, the adjudication team, the enforcement and penalties team, judicial review team, and the regulatory landscape and details team. These are teams that are created for this simulation. Uh, just so you know, the policy team, uh, uh, creates the shell of the statute. Once the class decides on the structure, they go and usually they pull apart some other regulatory framework that's out there. Usually it's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because uh, regulating nuclear power plants is a lot like regulating uh, T-Rexes. You know, if a T-Rex is, you know, running through Denver and eating people, that's kind of like a nuclear power plant meltdown. So they find a lot of language that they can use and, and they can crib. And that's what you have to, you have to take this language and adapt it. So that's a critical part of the transfer. They have to look at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission statute and figure out how they can adapt it to use it in this other context. Uh, and to me, they're doing that through the entire class. And that is transfer 
Um, that's the exact idea of transfer. Learn, you know, take something from this one context and use it in your new problem that you've been given. Um, so uh, the teams communicate with other teams through the discussion boards. Um, here's an example of one that I just pulled out. So here's, uh, here's one team saying, hey, rule makers, quick question. I would like to include language similar to the below. Are we allowed in our agency's enabling act to require other agencies to undertake formal or informal rulemaking as I've done below with OSHA and perhaps the EPA? So that's an interesting question, right? Um, in the real world, what would happen is Congress would have to, in creating this new statute, also amend these other statutes. Now, I can, I'm a magician, so I can just tell them, yes, you can amend these statutes, but you have to tell us where they would be amended. And you need to make sure there aren't, you know, undesirable consequences from the amendments you're doing. And so there's a class discussion. You can see here that OSHA gets involved and EPA gets involved in some other agencies. And so they learn a lot about interagency cooperation, which is not anything they really learn in a traditional administrative law class. And we, we achieve a level of complexity in this class that I think reflects the complexity of real world uh, you know, administrative agency regulation. And you can see um, how you know, they draft this language and, and how sophisticated uh, it is. Um, this is from 2012. Um, the coordination team takes the statute over about halfway through the class and their only job is to pull the statute together. They, so they run roughshod over the other teams and make sure they get their drafts together. Uh, this year, the coordination team was headed by a guy named Kyler Berge and he created a wiki. And so nothing went into the wiki unless he said it's final and goes into the wiki. So when the statute was created, it was basically a wiki and you can see there the different sections. Uh, their statute was called Jeeps. I forget what that stands for. Um, last semester, my students created FDSA, which is the Federal Dinosaur and Endangered Species Act, FDSA. Um, these laws run about 50 pages long um, and uh, they have every part of what an agency would have in it, rulemaking authority, uh, you know, information gathering authority, um, how do you enforce administrative um, agency um, actions in court, judicial review. Um, so everybody has a different part of this. I also have a regulatory details team, and this is a team that handles everything that falls through the cracks. So anything that doesn't fall in the other um, teams, they have to handle. And that team's very interesting. They do some very interesting things. One thing they have to come to grips with is extra territorial application. In Jurassic Park, all of the bad stuff happened uh, off the coast of Costa Rica, Isla Nublar. And, uh, and so uh, can US laws reach um, American companies working uh, in other countries? Uh, and there are, there, are, there are laws that have extraterritorial reach. Um, this last year, I had a student in that team who said, you know, I don't think that's enough because these dinosaurs are growing all over the world. You know, they're traveling through the ocean. I think we need a treaty. We need a, we need a world, we need a treaty for all the countries of the world to sign on to. And so he actually drafted a treaty. That was the first time that happened in the class. And there was another student in the class who was majoring in international law. And so she got together with him and helped him um, because he didn't know that much about treaty provisions. He just knows we, he just thought we needed a treaty. So they work together and that happens in this class all the time. I don't put any limitations on that. They can work across team to do things they need um, for the class. I had another person in my last class who, and this is a new thing, we're just now starting to teach animal law and animal rights at the law school. And so there was a, there was a woman in the class who said, um, geez, you know, you're creating these dinosaurs and dinosaur park licensing. What about um, human, humane treatment of the dinosaurs? And how do you dispose of them when they die? And how do you treat them when they're ill? And so she got together with another person from regulatory details and they put in a whole section on animal welfare uh, in the statute that had never been done before. Um, they just came up with it on their own. This is, this is you're, you're engaging students and you all know this, I'm preaching to the choir here. When you engage students and you give them license to do whatever they think needs to be done around a problem, you'll be amazed at what they can come up with, you know? Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I have to pay some attention. Now I have to go and learn some animal rights stuff <laughs> to make sure that what they've done is proper. Um, but, um, but, it, but, it, but the passion 
that comes out, the students really get into these simulations and I think they learn so much. You know, um, the first time I did this in 2003, the person who was heading the coordination team pulling the statute together, well, she is now uh, the chief legislative drafter for the state of Colorado. Uh, and she got her job because in her interview, she was able to talk about this crazy class she was in where they wrote legislation. Um, but, but these simulations create a passion in students. Before I would teach these classes and the student would take the classes and they'd have it on their transcript and go off and do whatever they wanted to do. But these classes develop in them a passion for the subject matter. And I have a lot more students who want to go into these areas as a result of uh, the engagement that they get uh, in these simulation classes. And then here's what the statute kind of looks like. It's a little bit boring here. You know, this is, um, I think this is from 2003 the Dinosaur Parks and Genetically Engineered Mesozoic Organisms Health and Safety Act of 2003. That's what they came up with. So, um, and uh, again, the coordination team makes sure, that in the end, they have a 50 page statute that looks like any other sort of bill that you would see in Congress. Um, the complexity, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, the complexity here. So one thing I always tell the teams they have to do is deal with the ethics. One of the big problems in administrative law is agency capture by private business. Uh, and boy, that's not that's not less of an issue now. <laughs> you know, that's a huge issue with agencies being taken over by corporations uh, who lobby them and things like that. So um, I tell students they need to have conflict of interest provisions because what's likely going to happen is Walt Disney, if they have a dinosaur park, they're going to become specialists in dinosaur parks. And a president like a Donald Trump will want to put um, the head of the dinosaur park division of Disney in charge of the regulatory framework. And so they need to think about conflict of interest provisions around there. The Securities and Exchange Commission actually has a decent set of conflict of interest provisions and that's what's going on here. They adapted um, that provision for their use. So they go in and they find a good sort of statute that they can use and then they, they copy it and they insert the language they need to insert um, for their own purposes. But remember, I told you about reflection. They have to tell me why in their individual report they did what they did. So here's an example of a student writing about that conflict of interest provision. So I'll just read real quickly. Here's the italicized portion. As a group, we worked via a Google document to create statutory language that we could include within the regulatory scheme that would govern conflict of interest issues, also included in postings below. Cameron found some great language from state agencies and I incorporated much of the language used in the US code to regulate improper behavior. Although the final version on the wiki was eventually amended, it was a good draft that got us all thinking about these issues and what the punishment for such violations should be. We upped the punishment for certain violations in order to deter government contact, conduct. Thinking about the role of sovereign immunity and the inability to sue federal officials under the court's doctrinal limitations to Bivens actions. I know that's a mouthful. That's a very complicated notion about who you can sue from the government in federal court. We thought it important to deter misconduct as much as possible considering the risks posed by this novel industry slash field. So that's the kind of reflection I get off of the individual accountability reports, which you know these reports, they need to keep that in mind as they're, as they're doing this. Why are you doing what you're doing? Um, another example, this is a provision, as I was previewing this a little earlier, um, this is a provision from the information team about they create this, um, this um, search team called HEAT. Whenever anybody thinks that somebody's stealing a dinosaur egg or something, then the HEAT team goes into action and the HEAT team can do whatever it wants. Uh, and I looked at this and I went like, wow, you think that's constitutional, huh? <laughs> You know, why don't you go back and look at the Burger case, you know, a couple of cases we looked at about the constitutionality of this. And I remember the students, they get so involved in this, they get so wedded to their language that they really said, well, we think it is. I don't know, it might be. So on the midterm then, uh, I made that a part of a problem. So what I do in the simulation classes is whatever happens in the class, I make those the problems on the midterm or on the final exam. So as you can see here, I uh, assume that Congress is considering legislation to allow creation of uh, dinosaur parks. Uh, assume that you're a lawyer for Biosyntech Corporation, a company with very keen interest in this legislation. In fact, Biosyntech is currently making plans to apply for a dinosaur park license as soon as allowed by statute. Dan Ross, the new general counsel, suspects that the current draft is unconstitutional. He's asked you to draft a memorandum assessing the constitutionality of the section 
please analyze fully all aspects of this. Uh, and then it says also, if the inspection and investigation section of the statute is unconstitutional, how would you modify it to make it constitutional, but at the same time maintain its enforcement effectiveness? So uh, after, the, after the midterm question here, and I got a lot of different answers about how it would be modified and virtually everybody said, yes, it is unconstitutional. The team then did modify and they had a lot of help about how it could be modified um, to be constitutional. Um, I just pulled this. Is, I taught this class last semester, um, and I and I actually wrote an article. I have a, about a fifty-page article detailing uh, the class because we're using new technology, and also I was teaching in a hybrid format where one third of the class is online, uh, which is great for group work because then you just move the group work to to online, uh, and the face to face is you know the other stuff. Uh, but here is um, one comment from a student. So our evaluations are anonymous. I was really impressed with the class. I said, I said, please um, write in your evals what could be done to um, to to make this better. Uh, and you hear, you see here. I don't know if you can see this. The simulation is perhaps one of the coolest things I've seen. It's extremely thought provoking. Builds on the literary skill of research synthesis, drafting, and communication, and bolsters core competencies typically gleaned from outside the classroom: collaboration, time management, accountability, compromise, empathy, etc. In my experience, the MO of law school, the singular final exam is not an effective means of preparing us for the real problems of practice. The problems encountered in Jurassic Park are akin to the problems we will be solving in practice and the simulation allows students to actually learn about themselves, their strengths and weaknesses that are gonna be more important to their professional progress than getting a sprint to the finish towards final. What's interesting about this and a lot of the evaluation comments were like this, they're not really about learning administrative law. They're about all of this other sort of affective, sort of soft skills that they picked up while doing this uh, at the same time that they're appreciating the complexity of this and, and, and how this really reflects what they'll probably encounter as lawyers in the real world. You know? um, so uh, then I get a little bit of a critique at the bottom about having the students uh, lead the classes. What's funny about the students teaching the classes is the students love to teach the classes, but they're not in love with students teaching the classes, <laughs> which is what I found, which is funny because it's the same discussion, it's just flipped. Um, but the students tend to think that the students are teaching the class more. Well, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but, um, but, it, but it's really the same kind of dialogue that you would have if I were in the front of the classroom. Um, so that's it for me. I have, uh, I have a book chapter on this with a lot more detail about both this simulation and the labor uh, law simulation. Uh, I, uh, I also have a draft of an article that I just wrote about the administrative law class that goes into quite a lot of detail. If you're interested in that, please um, just email me. Um, also, I have an SSRN page, and, and these things are on that page. Um, I belong, I'm an ETL fellow, Educating Tomorrow's Lawyers. There are a bunch of course portfolios that are simu similar to this with simulations on them, uh, and they're there at that URL, http colon slash slash educatingtomorrowslawyers.du.edu slash course dash portfolios. Uh, and you can see a lot of other classes that are sort of taught more or less in the same kind of framework. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I just love that idea. Um, I need to figure out how to do that for my class for sure. <laughs> um, we have a couple minutes for questions. I just want to let people know schedule wise, we're heading into a break here. The next, the second keynote will take place at 120 mountain time. Um, so if you need to step away, please do that and come back at 120. Otherwise, um, if there are a couple questions for Roberta, we can field some of those. I had shared a question a little bit ago, but I think it's probably buried up in the chat. Um, when Ro Roberto, when you were talking about, um, you know, you do your simulation on top of the exam because you didn't think your colleagues would appreciate if it was just the simulation. I'm curious if you have any way of knowing or if you've done any um, analysis of stats for how your students compare in those exams, those exit exams um, with your colleagues who don't engage in this type of um, deep simulation. I only have anecdotal. Apples and oranges. 
Yeah, I only really have anecdotal evidence of that from my students um, who, you know, I've been teaching 30 years and uh, students come back as alums um, and I talk to them and, you know, they, they find these classes to be quite memorable. Um, and, uh, and some of them actually go into the field as a result of that, but I don't really have any sort of cross comparison stuff. I did, um, when I was teaching the labor law simulation, I was interested in seeing whether students did better on simulation oriented questions versus um, questions that were just standard hypothetical type questions. So my labor law exam, fine, you know, I, I gave two questions that were standard labor law questions and then two questions that were questions out of the simulation. Um, and what I found was that students who had had me for classes before who hadn't done so well, so like C, um, B minus type students, um, they did better on the simulation questions than on the standard questions. So that's kind of interesting. So they, they were, in other words, they learned more um, by watching all the events unfold and having all of the law be contextualized in the simulation context. Uh, and of course, the, the better students still did better, but, but the students who traditionally had not performed well in those traditional exams and didn't perform as well in the traditional two questions performed better on the simulation questions, which is kind of interesting because, you know, when they're lawyers, it's all contextual. They're, they're living that. They're living their clients' lives and those facts over time. So, so, so it's interesting to think about whether law school exams really relate that much to how somebody will do as a lawyer, you know? Um, so I've done, so that's the only sort of studying I've really done. It's hard in, in education, you don't have real control groups. So, so it's tough. Um, okay, thanks. I didn't, I didn't know if there was any like data that your university collects on student performance or something that, you know, short of going and asking your colleagues, hey, how'd your kids do, which probably wouldn't be well met. <laughs> right. Well, we well only um, data related to passing the bar exam. So we, we collect bar exam, you know, you graduate from law school, you have to go and take the bar exam. What's funny is um, the law school has been engaged, engaged in an effort of creating these integrated type courses, which we call Carnegie Integrated Courses, CICs. And we've developed about 20 of them. Well, mm -hmm. it's totally correlational. But since the time that we've been doing these classes, our bar exam pass rate has shot up. <laughs> so I don't know that there's a connection between the two, but they, it has gone up since we started doing this, which is funny because there was a member of the board of trustees who was looking quizzically at us and saying, you know, you, you might be putting in jeopardy your bar exam pass rates with these kinds of courses, right? This is this whole students shouldn't be having fun, they might not pass the bar exam. Well, actually, it's just correlational, but it, there doesn't seem to be any jeopardy there. Yeah, I love that. Um, there was a comment in the chat, Roberto, where do you find your inspiration? Obviously, this is your group, but did you have another source like this group that you would use for inspiration? No, no, I, in law, you know, I, I now have in other parts of the world. Um, law simulations are done quite robustly uh, in Scotland, uh, in the UK. Uh, I contributed a chapter to a book out of, um, out of the UK uh, on law school simulations. Um, and in Hong Kong and in Australia, they do these, but they're not really, they're only starting to emerge now in the US. I do have a colleague, David Thompson, at the law school who teaches a discovery practicum in this format. And now I have colleagues teaching uh, simulations like this here now. So, so you know, we talk quite a bit uh, about these uh, simulations, but I really, um, it's just uh, the labor law one is the one I started because my students didn't have experiences with unions and they weren't gonna understand the case law about unions, which are out of manufacturing, you know, Detroit and things like that. And so I said, I need to find a way to get, have them have a union experience that they can use to understand these cases. And, and so, well, you know, a professor giving assignments to students, that's like an employer giving work to employees. So why don't I just use um, the classroom as an analogy? And then and, and that ended up working. And then people said, well, you did that for labor law. That's so perfect, but you can't do that for any other class. And that's when I said, well, let me try it for administrative law. And that's when I came up with Jurassic Park. And by the way, I have other ideas that, you know, Harry Potter book five uh, is all about administrative law, the ministry of magic. Um, I'm dying to teach an administrative law class and have the students 
uh, write a statute for um, what proper administrative procedure should be with the Ministry of Magic, for example. I'm just afraid that some of the people will be into Harry Potter and others won't, uh, you know, but I'm thinking of doing that. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the, the original movie with Gene, Gene Wilder, ha almost all of contract law is in that movie. And what's funny about that is none of it is in the Roald Dahl book. That was all just added in by whoever produced that movie. Um, and, uh, and so um, I've actually given some questions on finals out of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So I'm always looking at sources of facts like that, you know, um, you know plays or books or movies uh, give you a rich, you know, contoured, um, you know, set of facts that you can play with uh, and you can apply them in uh, almost any kind of context. So, so my inspiration is books, movies, uh, you know, that I see and that I read. By the way, I would just say people were mentioning Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is amazingly complex. Uh, and uh, my daughter just graduated from a, from a college in the UK, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda. And all of her, she has a degree in professional acting, but all of her classmates were heavily into D&D. &D. Uh, a lot of them were dungeon masters and she started doing Star Wars D&D. &D. Uh, and uh, talk about critical thinking. I mean, these, these um, backgrounds and scenarios are incredibly complex uh, and require all kinds of creative thinking, um, you know, across scenarios. And so I'm just starting to get into that now. I'm just now sort of developing a background in my D&D characters. But uh, that's a, there's a lot of promise there. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe in the future, I'll be pulling some of that in. I love that idea. Any other questions? Well, I can ask a quick one. Um, since we got a little bit of time, you know, you you found your road to doing this. What would you advise, especially younger faculty, pre tenure? You know, how do you get into owning your playfulness in your teaching? Um, you know. Uh, you know, it came for me, it came, it came from just an intense desire to teach effectively. You know, uh, I was teaching this labor law class and students were not understanding uh, the doctrines. All the cases were out of Detroit and manufacturing context and this and that. And my students weren't getting it. Uh, and so how can I get my students this contextual knowledge that they need to be able to understand the law? So it just came really out of a desire to be an effective teacher. Uh, and um, that's always been my guide. You know, I had people before tenure, people are saying, do this stuff, but don't tell anybody about it because, you know, this could jeopardize your tenure or this stuff, you're creating this stuff and that's taking a lot of your time and energy away from scholarship and things like this. And um, I, you know, and I, and I didn't really start doing these simulations until about my fifth year. So I was almost on the verge of getting tenure anyway. Um, but but it all just stems from a desire to teach effectively, really. Um, I wanna engage students and this stuff engages them. Uh, and so why should, I, why should I shy away from it? Why should I, I, I just never have understood, let's make this incredibly boring and dense and difficult um, because then they'll have survived some kind of weird hazing uh, and then they'll be lawyers. This is never, I've never understood that, you know? Um, so, so for me, I, I have never, done poorly by trying to learn to teach more effectively. And I, and I think if that's, what you, if that's what you're coming from, I think you'll always be in good. You know, you have to be careful. You have to know the people around you in your context and all that. And I had people who were incredibly supportive uh, and the people who didn't think I was doing anything that was very meaningful or good, at least they left me alone um, to do it, you know. But, but teaching, I just wanted to teach better. I wanted my students to understand. I wanted them to learn better. And so that's what this all comes from.